What's going on today? It's your host, Zach Shoes, Shoemaker, and today I'm being joined by one of the top transfers from the offseason. He's a former five-star recruit, a top 25 ranked player, and was also a member of the Jordan Brand Classic. After that, he played the past two seasons at Memphis, where he was also a member of a preseason all-AAC second team selection in his sophomore year. He now has transferred out to Mississippi State, where he's expected to be one of the top players, not just at Mississippi State, but also in the entire SEC. And that's DJ Jeffries. Obviously, this is a new life for you right now. You made the big transfer now out to Mississippi State. You guys are looking like a top team in the country right now, probably going top 15, top 20, whenever they release those. But it's a new home for you. You're back home originally where you grew up at. But how are you adjusting yeah. to campus? And what's it like getting out there now? Um, It's a little different. You know, like, it's not – like, I'll say, like, it's a, it's a better, like, college feel than Memphis. You know, Memphis obviously was a, a great college experience. You know, like, everything that I did there, you know, and all the things I accomplished there was great, but like mm-hmm. it's just a different little feel now, you know. Like you get to, like it's just like more on campus, you know. Like you get to live like a more college experience life, you know. Like it, I don't know how to explain it, you know, but like I just feel like it's a a, a more college experience to, to me now, you know, than it was at Memphis. But. Now Memphis wasn't too far away from where you grew up in home wise, but you're back in the state you yeah. grew up in. So how's that been? Mm-hmm. Like it's been nice being back around family and even closer to family now. Um, it's definitely, Memphis was definitely, like, closer to home, you know, like, mm-hmm. I spent, like, most of my childhood, like, growing up and playing basketball in Memphis, so, like, when I played in high school, just being in Mississippi, you know, it was, it was different, like, it made me feel, like, comfortable in Mississippi, you know, because I made a name for myself mm-hmm. in Mississippi, so, you know, like, people look at me, like, it's this, you know, Mississippi high school basketball legend, so, you know, it's definitely fun to come back and play in, um, your home state, you know, and where I'm from, Holly Springs, is no, it's like two hours away. So, you know, like my grandma and all my family, like there is nowhere for them to come down and see me play. So, yeah, it was um, coming back home was definitely big in my transfer. I've got to ask, I know each guy kind of has some schools they like watching growing up, but was it Mississippi State your dream school? Was that even a school you really liked growing up or who kind of was the dream school for you growing up? Um. Not gonna lie, my dream school was when I was younger. It was like just growing up watching those great Memphis teams with Cal had um mm-hmm. like D Rose and all those guys. So like going to Memphis was originally my dream school because you know like I grew up in that area. But I went and now you know now I'm here in Mississippi State. So you know I really didn't I really didn't like I knew they had like I knew they had a great program, but like just recently when they started recruiting me in high school, you know like they they was always like they pursued me for like so long and I built a great relationship with them. So like, I felt like it was a no brain to come down here and come back to Mississippi, you know, and play with, and come do something for the Mississippi with Mississippi State. We're going to get more into Mississippi State to wrap this up in the end, but I want people to get to know your story a little bit and how you've ultimately become the guy that we all know today. So we head back, yeah. like we've already talked about, you grew up in Mississippi. What was it like growing mm-hmm. up out there though? Uh, growing up out of the branch, you know, it's really, it's really not nothing for real. You know, it's just, mm-hmm. Is y'all you got really is basketball. Well, Olive Branch is more of a football school, you know. Like before I got there, they was telling me going to Olive Branch, I was tripping, you know. It was like, uh, you going to a football school, you're not gonna get this school, you're not gonna get that school. So, you know, like I really never cared what people thought or had to say, you know, I knew that I was gonna do what I had to do regardless. So like going in there, I knew that I was gonna get the college that I wanted because of AAU, and you know, all I had to do was just be consistent, you know. So like and, you know, Memphis is nowhere. So, like, we played a lot of teams in Memphis. You know, in my ninth year, we beat a couple good Memphis teams. You know, and then after that, the rest is history. Like, we just started getting better and better. And we won um, the first state championship in our county my junior year. And then mm-hmm. we lost my senior year to another team in our county named Center Hill. But, like, just back-to-back state championships in the Soto County was big because ain't nobody ever besides the girls out of branch. Nobody on the boys' side did it, but us in Santa Hill. So, like, that was big for the state, of, for our county. Now, growing up, like you said, Mississippi has talent comes out of it. There still are good players for, that play basketball that come out of there. But, obviously, we know dominant mm-hmm. down that area, obviously, Georgia area. They've got better basketball, too. But Texas, obviously, Mississippi, like, all that area is really known and dominated by football. So, 
how did you kind of fall mm-hmm. in love with basketball? Like, was it a family thing that kind of passed down to you? Was it just your area you were in? Like, what kind of brought you into basketball? And why did you first start playing the sport? Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, growing up, I, I kind of wanted to play football. But, you mm-hmm. know, my grandma and them never let me play flag football. So I didn't get to play football originally until I went to middle school in Memphis at Cordova. But, like, growing up, my uncle kind of put me into basketball. You know, he worked at the YMCA. and he put me in his little, um, I forget what type of league it was. Like, you know, you know the little YMCA mm. leagues that they have for kids to play. So, like, my uncle signed me up for that. And then after that, the rest is history. You know, like, it's just, I've been going on, I've been going up ever since then. Like, but really, basketball was something, you know, for them to keep me out of trouble. Cause I was, I used to be in trouble when I was a younger kid. But, like, once they started taking basketball away from me, you know, that's when I found my love for basketball. And I was like, Mm-hmm. I gotta stop getting in trouble. Like you know, I gotta like if I if I keep messing up in school, if I keep doing this, like basketball gonna be taken away from me. So like that made me like just lock in and like just do right so I can play the game of basketball because I ain't want to lose basketball. So so when did this all click for you? Like when did that time come? Like when was that where you started saying you know basketball? What I truly love. Like I want to pursue this. This is what I want to do for as long as I possibly can. Like when did that start happening for you? Um. Uh, I had to say my eighth grade year because like from fourth grade, fourth grade all the way to like seventh grade, like I had actual spurts of me being good, but like I didn't know how to be consistent with it, you know, then like eighth grade, when well, no, actually I dunked my first time in seventh grade. So like that eighth grade year, like I started catching lobs and like it was crazy, you know, it was, it was crazy. So like um, my eighth grade year, I started getting confidence in myself and I was like, you know, I actually can do some of this. Like, I need to take it more serious. So, like, I broke my wrist that summer. And, like, you know, typical kids, you know, you go out and just be hanging out with your friends. You know, you can't do much because you hurt. So, like, I was just hanging around the neighborhood with my friends, you know, just doing typical kid stuff. And then, you know, one day my dad, my dad and uncle, they came looking for me, you know, because I, um, I was supposed to be at a workout and I wasn't at a workout. So they caught me out with some friends and, you know, they kind of cussed me out, got on to me. And then after that, I noticed that it's bigger than, you know, it's bigger than me just being, you know, DJ. Like, like I got an um, image now. Like, I got to hold on this image that, like, everybody that sees me in the community, they look to me at, at a higher standard. So I can, you know, be hanging around the guys that I used to hang around. Like, I got to separate myself from people. So, like, I just started taking basketball more serious. I started getting the gym more and, like, just dedicating myself to get better because, you know, I want a better life for me and my family. So, you know, and I want my kids to grow up and don't have to go through some of the things I had to go through growing up. So it's just, they're just like going through stuff like that just made me figure out that I need to do this and, you know, get better. What would you say is the biggest thing from growing up in that environment, kind of go, dealing with all the stuff you had to deal with until obviously becoming the person you are today? Like, what would you say is the biggest mm-hmm. lesson you learned or maybe even the biggest thing that's helped make you the person that you are today? Um, I would just say like all the, all the, figures in life you know like everything that you go through in life like you're gonna have a lot of wins you're gonna have a lot of losses like you just gotta live and learn like i didn't i didn't had a lot of situations in my life you know where i failed and i felt like you know i should give up or i should quit but you know it's just me like i i truly believe that god gave his toughest battle to his toughest soldier so like mm-hmm. every time that some in my life get hard or you know something that i go through that i don't understand you know i feel like it's a reason why i'm going through it you know at the end, I always like when I don't quit, it always be a good, a good reward at the end. So like I just feel like all the losses and all the things that I endured in my life, you know, made me the person I am today. I know you're also a believer, and we talked about that a little bit before we started this. And when would you say mm-hmm. that you kind of started that relationship with God? Like, was it kind of from time time you were a kid growing up? Was it you start really getting closer yeah. to God in middle school, high school? Like, when did you really start forming that bond with God? I always been since a little kid, like my grandma always been big on God, you know, like mm-hmm. everything we did, um, like you get in trouble in school, God watching, you know, like just any little thing, you know, like mm-hmm. just trying to scare us and let us know, like, if you cuss, you're not going to make it to heaven, you know, like religion always been big for me. And, you know, like my first time, like out of nowhere, like in the middle of church, I was like 10, maybe like. They was asking who wanted to get baptized. And I don't know what, I still don't know what made me to this day get up and get baptized. Like, you know, I got up and got baptized. And then, like, I grew up in a church, you know, like, so religion is big for me. You know, like, my grandma, I talk to her almost every day. And, like, 
she always tell me, she was like, DJ, no matter what you go through, you know, just pray, like just pray about it. And then what's meant to be will be like God, God has the, um, God has what he has for you already in store. You just got to go out there and do your part. So like, I just, you know, the religion is big for me. So I believe that everything that's meant for me, meant to be in my life will happen. Now, I'm not sure if this is complete accurate. You might correct me if I'm wrong here, but I know there's also a story back when you were in middle school. I know you talked about a little bit on your day in the life with Ball's life back a few years ago, obviously back when you were in high school, but you obviously grew up in Mississippi. You were going out to a school in Memphis. As you just mentioned earlier, too, you already were dunking in middle school. So take us yeah. to the environment. I know you're trying to mention somewhere that people were following you guys back and forth. I just walk us mm-hmm. through what all that was about. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, um, Olive Branch, like, it's literally like a little imaginary line that separates Olive Branch and Memphis. So, like, mm-hmm. I stayed in Olive Branch. And the reason why I went to Memphis is because in sixth grade in Mississippi, you can't play basketball. So, like, my dad didn't want me to miss out on basketball for a year. So, I went out to Memphis, and, you know, Sixth grade, they wasn't really worried about me because, you know, I wasn't doing anything. Like, we, I was young, a skinny kid, couldn't do nothing. Mm-hmm. Seventh grade, I had an all right year. But my eighth grade year, when I started dunking and catching lobs, you know, everybody like, okay, so, <laughs> something ain't right, you know. So, like, I think we was in we was in the playoffs one day, and we was playing a team like Highland Oaks. And I had, like, I dunked on a kid, you know. And, like, I had, like, I don't know, like, maybe 20 or 30 points at halftime. Mm-hmm. So, we get into halftime, my coach, he come in, he was like, he like, man, uh, me and this another kid named Josh, he was like, man, somebody from the board turned y'all in. He was like, y'all can't uh, play with the rest of the second half. Mm-hmm. You know, at the, at the time, I like, like, I didn't understand, like, like, damn, what I do this time? You know, like, not knowing, like, not knowing that I, that people turn me in for living out of the branch. Like, I didn't know that, so. After the game, we figured out that somebody just told on us and said that we stayed, that I stayed in all the branch. They had pictures of my driver's license plate. Like, they was following us home and stuff. Like, it was crazy. Like, it's crazy how how people, you know, how passionate they are about basketball. Like, they'll go to the streams to follow you home. Like, take a picture of your license plate just to prove to you that, you know, you don't live in that area. So, like, it was, it was crazy to me. But I knew I didn't want to go through that for another four years. So, like, this is why I went back home. In high school, I was like, man, I'm not going to keep getting up at 5.30 in the morning, you know, to go to a school. And I got a high school right down the street from me. So this, like, this is why I chose to go to Olive Branch. Now, that decision is something that some people obviously aren't always following. Some, a lot of guys typically would spend the freshman year at the local high school. But we see now in the past four or five mm-hmm. years, this movement going to the big prep schools, going to Montverde and IMG, uh, Easy Compass. Now, these yeah. schools are popping up all over the place now. But what led mm-hmm. you to stay at one school? Like, was that always a plan? Did you ever consider going to one of these prep schools? Like, mm-hmm. where did you stand with that stuff? Um, originally going in, I talked to my mom and dad and my uncle and them. I was just like, uh, I want to go out of the branch, you know, like I want to do something special for all the branch because all the branch I never won a state championship before. So I was like, I want to do something special for my hometown. Well, not, not my hometown because Holly Springs is my hometown, but like mm-hmm. where I was living at. So I want to do something special was for all the branch and then at first the real really my big reasons of doing it because I saw Malik Newman have so much success in high school like he won four straight championships in Mississippi and he was like the number one player all the way through high school so I was like if Malik can do it I know I can do it so like I wanted to be like known as a Mississippi legend I didn't want to go out and be go to the Mount Verbs and like schools like that when I know I can you know bring college coaches to all the branch and you know do something good for the kids after me, you know, like it's bigger. It's always been bigger than just me, you know, like I always want to do something for like kids that's coming after me. Like I got little brothers, I got little cousins, you know, like Mm -hmm. I'm trying to set a good example for them and show them that it's more than life than, you know, street violence and like stuff like that. So like, I just want to be a big picture in my community. You know, I want to be somebody that people can look up to and be like, if he did it, I can do it. You know, I just want to be a motivator. So that's why I chose to stay home. Like, yeah, I could have went to Oak Hill. I could have went to Mount Vernon, but like, mm-hmm. it, it was bigger than that for me. That's what a lot of guys from Mississippi do. Obviously the biggest one that just moved on to college now, Deshaun Ruffin, he obviously is a top five-star rate mm-hmm. recruit going out to Ole Miss, staying even home there too. Like yeah. when you talk about that though, I mean, I'm sure the community is pretty tight between the basketball guys. Cause we talked about earlier, like there's not too many guys. It's not like a state that has, 100 plus guys going to be one each year. 
So what's the basketball community? Like when you talk about those yeah. guys that make it to the next level, how tight are you guys? Um, I talk to these guys sometimes, you know, like me and Deshaun really don't talk that much, but you know, like I like to see any Mississippi kid win, you know, like mm-hmm. I beat him his first two years and like his first two years in high school. So like, he's always been tough to me. Like I knew that like, once I got out of high school, like it was a sky's limit for him. Like he was going to win. Like he, he always been a tough kid. Like he always been a competitor. And like what he did for that school down there, like he brought back Callaway basketball. Cause like for a minute when Malik, left, they didn't have nobody like this. So Deshaun was like the next Malik for them, you know, like mm-hmm. and what he did, he had a great high school career and, you know, like, just anybody from Mississippi that is trying to make it, like you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna push them and I'm gonna like support them because like I know how hard it is to make it out of Mississippi, you know, because like typically don't nobody come to Mississippi looking for no ball players like that. Like we probably got one out of a dozen, you know, that you might hear about, you know. So like when there was somebody good in Mississippi trying to make it, you know, I'm supporting them because I know how it feels, you know, like. I feel like it ain't no hate in Mississippi. Like we all, we all generally love each other. Like we, we like to see everybody make it. Now I know you also are either related to, you're close to the Lawson brothers. Obviously, there's a lot of them: DJ, KJ, Chandler, and John. Now, John's yeah. obviously the youngest one now heading out to uh, Memphis this year too as a freshman. Walk us to yep. your guys' ball. Like, how did you guys get to know them, or what's your relationship like with them? Um, KJ and DJ, like those guys, like they, they basically like big brothers that I never had, you know, like they, mm-hmm. they helped me with stuff that I don't understand, you know, like just seeing them go through things they went through in college, like they talked to me about things and like even this summer, like when I was leaving Memphis, like I was telling Jonathan and Chandler, I was like, like Memphis not a bad spot for y'all, like I feel like they'll be good for y'all, like I, like me and Chandler I've always been tight, like we always been competitive, like it's always been me and Chandler in the city of Memphis in our class, so like they always try to bash us and make us compete, but like at the end of the day, it's always just been love between me and him, you know. And of course, Lil Johnson, like, I always loved Lil Johnson. Like, mm-hmm. I knew he was going to be special, you know, from a little kid. So, like, just having a good bond with those guys, you know. Obviously, KJ and Deidre set the standards for their little brothers. And, you know, they did – their parents did a great job with all four of them because, you know, they, they're great young, they're great people. You know, they, they're a great family. And, you know, like, just – we just got a great relationship. You know, I don't really know how to put it into words, but, like, I just know, like, we tight, like I'm supporting them. I know they support me. Like I just want to see everybody that that I miss with do good in life. So like those are most definitely my guys. So I want to see them do good this year. I'm not sure if it's ever going to line where you guys do end up playing Memphis, rather it be this year or the following season or something like that. But if you guys mm-hmm. do play them, not just the fact that obviously it'd be your old team, but just in terms of playing the younger brothers, the guys that you've grown up with in Chandler and John, what would that be like yeah. going up against them in a game? I mean, it'll, it'll be a dream come true, you know, playing against guys that I've been playing against my whole life. You know, like, of course, it's going to be a competitive game. Of course, they going to want to win. I'm going to win, you know. But, like, at the end of the day, Memphis is going to win no matter how, how it goes, you know. Cause like, all of us are considered Memphis kids, you know. Like, no matter what happens in that game, like, at the end of the day, Memphis wins, you know. Like, all those are my guys. Like, I check up on all those guys all the time, you know. It, it's love. So, like. I hope that we can see them one day and play. Like, they'll be they'll be my dream. You know, they'll be a dream game for me going back and being able to play against Memphis, you know. So, have them, you know, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. So, let's hop into this high school career. And as we talked about now, you chose to go to Olive Branch High. And as we kind of mentioned, yeah. like, that's a situation where you walk in there and you know that you're not going to get the spot like that. Guys might get yeah. like, going to prep school, even going to school like a California school, Texas, something. So what kind of were your expectations? Like before you ever played that an actual high school game, did you expect yourself yeah. to become a five strike? Did you think you could get to that level, not just talent wise, but you know, earn the respect of media yeah. guys too? Like, did you think you could accomplish all you did in high school as a freshman? Um, I'm not gonna lie, I had a, little, I had a couple of doubts because like mm-hmm. going to any level as a freshman is gonna be hard for you. You're gonna have your ups and downs and like, I never, like coming to high school, we used to live weights, you know, I ain't never lived weights before. So like, the transition to the weight room, like that was that was big for me, cause like I didn't know, like I didn't, I could I barely could lift two twenty five. I mean, twenty five on the east side, like I barely could lift the bar, like it was crazy. So like just getting stronger each and every year in high school, and like playing against like guys like Michael Porter and like R.J. Beard, and like just playing against guys that like got experience of playing against other great high school players, you know, just learning from them and like 
actually seeing that I can compete with them let me know that it's like I can maybe one day go to college, you know, maybe one day get to the NBA, you know, like just playing against guys like that and being able to compete with them, like it was big for me because I always felt to myself, like no matter how people looked at me and felt like I was a fast star, you know, like I always felt like I was, you know, kind of underrated, kind of, you know, under the radar because I'm from Mississippi, you know, I don't got nobody coming to film me and, you know, making highlight tapes of me. So like every chance I get, I'm just, I'm, I tried to show everybody who DJ Jeffrey was, you know, I was successful sometimes, sometimes I wasn't, but you know, at the end of the day, like I just kept pushing. And like I told you, like we was talking about before, like with God, like mm -hmm. God has always been big in my life. So like, even when I felt like I was going to fail, like I knew it is a reason why I'm not getting all this attention. Like I know that it's a, it's a long, like it's a bigger goal. Like instead of just like, like I, I never really cared to have, I always wanted the balls like mixtape, but like I never cared to have one, you know, cause like that puts a target on your back. Like everybody that I saw that had one, like I wanted to, when I played them, like I wanted to show them like, I, like I'm just as good as you, you know? So like, I'll say that my biggest thing was just going in and like beating my expectations, like being better than what people thought I can be, you know? So like, that was my biggest thing going into high school. Most that don't know your story, obviously just look at you and they look at your rankings. You came out as a five-star, top 25 ranked player. You ended up getting a lot of those balls, life mixtapes. You were put all over the place, a high, high presence on media kind of personality player then. But when did you yep. start getting used to that? And when did that kind of come to you? Like at what point would you say it kind of turned the page for you? All of a sudden you're like, okay, now I'm getting attention. Now I'm getting the rankings. Mm -hmm. Like when did that all happen for you? Um, I really had to say when I committed to Kentucky, no, because like, Commit to Kentucky, like, that, that's big, you know, like, most kids your age don't get a Kentucky offer, you know, like, when I committed to Kentucky, I was like, damn, like, I, I can do anything, because basketball has been, you know, like, the odds have never always been on my side, and, like, finally being able to do something like that, and, like, just seeing how proud my family was, you know, like, it was just crazy, you know, like, it, it made me feel like they like, I'm bigger than just, like, DJ, the normal kid, you know, like, Cause I I feel like I'm the most homeless person I know. So like, no matter what, like you can, my friends, you can ask family, like you can ask anybody. Like I treat myself like I'm a normal person. You know, like I don't care about being a five star. I don't care about being this top college basketball player. Like you know, I'm gonna be me at the end of the day. And this how this is how in my life I feel like my humble beginnings and my humble starts. Like that's what made me the person I am today. So like, I never get caught up in being like one of those. You know celebrity guys that don't take pictures with people, don't talk to people, don't stop and give people autographs. Like, I'm humble because I know how it feels like to to be in those positions because, like, God just blessed me with a talent and, and he can take that away from you at any moment. So, like, this is why I'm forever humble because, like, at any moment it can be taken from me. That freshman year of high school, you guys go as a whole team, 18 and 10 overall. Obviously, you didn't have quite the role you end up getting later on in your high school career, but – how big was yep. that freshman year of high school for you? And just how did you ultimately grow as a player to help become the guy you eventually become in high school? I ain't gonna lie, it was a guy, this guy named Trey Boyd. Um, my, um, he was a senior, you know, like he used to, I used to think he was annoying my freshman year because like, dude, why are you always missing me? But like, <laughs> he told me like, he told me how to be like, how to be like a leader, you know, like how to be like an alpha dog, like go out there and take, take what's yours, you know, and like, I still talk to him to this day, like he, he still try to reach out and help me and give me a little pointers, but like, just him going at me every day, you know, like him teaching me stuff as a young kid that I didn't know at the time, like, I feel like he was just, you know, just being hard on me for no reason, but like, he was just trying, he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, you know, and like, once I finally, once he left and I had to do, had to do what he had to do, like, I finally understood where he was coming from. Like, I finally understood why he was in the gym every night putting up shots, like, why he was doing this, why he was doing that, you know? Like, mm -hmm. so I feel like it wasn't for him being there for me my first year. I probably wouldn't be the person I am today because, like, he pushed me to get better. Like, he pushed me to want to be better than him because, like, any time that he got the best of me, he was going to let me know, you know, I didn't want him to keep getting the best of me. So, you know, it's like, he made me the person I am today. So, like, I'm forever grateful for him for that. I also wrote a story that you weren't always the guy that shot a lot of shots. We know your upperclassman years, that was the guy you ended up in 24 game. But before that, like what kind of led you in your underclassman year? Like, were you not shooting too much? And what ultimately flipped the switch for you to said, now I'm going to start shooting balls. Like what kind of led to that switch for you? 
Um, naturally, man, I've always been the unselfish person. Like, mm-hmm. hell, let, let people tell I didn't shoot enough my high school career, you know? So, like, i always been unselfish, man. It's like, to a, to a default, like, mm-hmm. some nights I go out, some nights I go out there and, like, score 40 or 30, and then it'd be nice I'd just be out there chilling, you know? Like, I'll say my sophomore year when I lost in state, like, actually having to be the leader for that first time, like, I put in my mind that, like, okay, like, maybe it's okay to be selfish sometimes, like, like, because I'm obviously the best player on my team, so, like, in order for us to win, I got to do more than just pass up shots, you know, or let somebody else that, you know, take mm-hmm. shots. So I had to, like, take initiative and work on my game and become better so, like, I can put my team in a good position where if we are 30 or 40, who cares who, shoot, who shot the most shots at that time? You know, like, I did what we had to do to win. So, like, just going through those little – those like, just maturing really made me realize that, I had to shoot the ball more. I had to be more assertive. Like, I had to do more. So, yeah. Your sophomore year of high school, you end up adding in a guy that you're going to be reunited with now in Cam. He obviously is going to be a guy that had a great freshman season last year. Obviously, probably get a much larger role this year, too, now. But take us mm-hmm. to your guys' ball. Like, what was it like getting to know him from a young age? And now, also, just how excited you be to be reunited with him? I've been seeing Cameron since he was young. You know, like, we probably, he probably didn't know who I was. I didn't know who he was. But, like, I used to always see him playing AU ball, but, like, just just seeing his growth to see where he came from, you know, like, a lot of people don't know that. I think he was, like, a high school – I mean, a middle school quarterback. Like, he, football was his first sport. So, like, mm-hmm. just him – just seeing where he – how much he can grow to a basketball player because I don't feel – he's been playing basketball his life. But like, I think football was his first love. And, like, I used to be – I was his, I was hard on him all the time, man, because, like, to me, behind me, he was the like he was the second best player to me. Like he didn't shoot the ball at all. He'd be mad. Like I was like, dude, like you too talented to like to be out here just to sell for like ten points. You know, you can go out there and score thirty. Like he can he can get a triple double if he wanted to. Like he always been genetically big. Always been athletic. Like he his own biggest critic. You know, like he his, like he hold himself back. Like he got so much talent that he don't even understand. Like and. Me as a big brother, you know, I try to help him out with a lot of things because, like, he hard on himself. Like, he don't understand, like, he don't understand how good he is. And, like, for me, I'm trying to push him to be better because I want him to be better than me. You know, like, I want him to reach his goals because I know how it feels, like, to feel like you suck. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know how it feels to not have nobody there for you. So, like, I just try to show him the ropes. And, you know, I try to show him how his basketball still works. Like, I try to push him to be better. I try to push him to get in the gym, like, just work on your game. And, like, he got the ability to make it. Like, he got the body. Like, he, he can play. Like, he can do pretty much anything he want to do. Like, it's just on him. Like, my main thing with him, I just want to see him grow mentally. Like, I want him to believe in himself. Like, I believe him, you know? Like, once he do that, the sky's the limit for him. You guys have one special moment, probably a lot more than this, but probably the biggest one together is that your junior year, you guys go out there, win a state championship, Obviously, that's what mm-hmm. you talked about. This has been your goal. You wanted to stay home. You wanted to achieve that. Take us to that run, though. Like, getting to finally achieve the ultimate goal you've had for your high school career. What was that like? Yeah. Man, it was, I ain't gonna lie, it was a crazy year. Like, coming in, like, we all dedicated. Like, we all dedicated ourselves. Like, we like, we gonna do it this year. Like, we all got in shape. Like, we all played team ball. Like, well, yeah, we played team ball. But, like, I'll say it was a, it was a game, like, we lost because, like, a lot of guys are being selfish. But, like, after that, like, we came in, we came together, we were like, we're not losing no more. Like, you know, we going we gonna to do this. So, like, we went on and we beat East, and, you know, like, we started beating teams like that. And, like, we saw that, like, we really could do it. And once we got to State, like, we already had in our mind who was the best team in State. So, like, wasn't nobody going to beat us then. Like, we was too locked in. Because we was beating everybody by 20. So, I didn't feel like it was no team that could beat us that year. But one of my teammates named JD, he felt like he felt differently. But we would have beat them too. So if we would have played them, we would have beat them easily. But yeah, but that was a great run though. Like I felt, I felt accomplished after that. Like I was like it was a big relief on my shoulder. Like I finally, I finally did something. Like I finally accomplished my goal. And like originally, I committed to Kentucky after that. So like I was at, a, I just felt like I was at the top of the rear at that time. So. And at that point, we kind of talked about it earlier, but you now grow into this where you kind of have a much larger image now in your state, especially, and even across mm-hmm. the country. You start getting your rankings up to a five-star status. 
your followers start going up a lot. And we mentioned it too, like mm-hmm. out there in Mississippi, it's known for football. Those are the biggest stars. Those are the high school and college kids that get all attention. You're this basketball guy yeah. now. You're coming out here and you're reaching this level that is well known. People want to be around you. How have mm-hmm. you adjusted to that? Because you go play even in different states in the circuits. Like people know who you are now. You're a five star. How did you start yeah. adjusting to that lifestyle, having the tension the cameras on you now? I'm not even gonna lie to you, man. Like I still really ain't got adjusted. You know, like <laughs> like I still feel like like my my people ask me all the time, man. Like, like how do you deal with people coming up to you? Like I was like, I mean, it's like. I like it, but like at the same time, it's like, like I'm just DJ, you know, like, like I'm just like you, I'm just like you guys. I just play basketball, you know, like it's crazy, it's crazy what basketball can do for you, you know, like, like basketball can bring you so much fame, so much money, you know, like it can bring you, if you're not mature enough or if you're not used to like having stuff like that, like it can ruin you, you know, like it can mess you up mentally, like it's a lot of things that it can do to you, and like going back to me being humble, like just seeing kids knowing me like from different states and different cities like they just let me know that all my hard work and all everything that I did like it's showing you know like I'm I'm finally doing something good in my life you know and I'm forever proud of myself for that you know I'm grateful for that like it's a lot of nights that I cried that I won't quit you know but like I kept going and like it's just crazy knowing that people like all over the world know you so like Cause I ain't feel like I ain't feel like a lot of people knew me outside of Mississippi. You know, like once I got to circus, people were like, "Hey, that's DJ," you know, and stuff like that. Like, but I ain't gonna lie, when I come into Kentucky, this when people really started like, you know, just noticing me. They like, "That's DJ." He come into Kentucky, like blah blah, blah stuff like that. And just everywhere I go now, you know, it's either he come into Kentucky or they know me for what I did in Memphis. You know, like it was crazy. It's just crazy, like knowing that people your age or older, like they, they real deal, like look up to you. Like they, they fantasize you because like all the great things you've been doing and like, it's just a blessing. It's a blessing. What would you say was the hardest part about that? Like during that time frame where you start getting all this attention spot on you, what was the hardest mm-hmm. thing to deal with during that? Um, just remaining like, remain, staying true to yourself. You know, like, like I said, a lot of people, when they ain't used to having fame, when they ain't used to having a lot of things, like they kind of let they get to their head, and, you know, like mm-hmm. I try not to let that happen, you know, like I tried to stay the same, like everybody I used to hang out with, like I still hung out with them, like from a ki- from the the kid, the link, like, you know, how people be like the less popular kid in school, like even if they came to me and said what's up or anything, like I tried to show everybody love, you know, like I tried to remain the same, like this is just who I am, like I'm I feel like I love too much, you know, like I feel like I care for people too much. And like that could be my biggest, my worst, my worst, um, I forgot the word, but yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. But like, yeah, I feel like that's my that is my biggest, my biggest enemy, like my heart. Like mm-hmm. I care for so many people. Like, I want to see so many people win. Like I put people before me, you know, and like that goes back to like sometimes being selfish. Like it's always been my it's always been my problem. Like I'd rather see everybody else win before me because I know that I can get it, you know? But, like, I guess, I don't know. I don't know. And that is a huge thing, too, because we see with a lot of players, and obviously a lot of them we might have an example as other followers, God following Christian men that are also our athletes in various different sports Mm -hmm. out there. But that's kind of, like you said, it's a blessing, but also can be a curse if you don't use it right at times, too. And we know, obviously, Mm -hmm. according to the Bible, like following others, loving, put others before yourself. But at the same time, yeah. like, you still have to find a way to do that and still perform on the court because when you're playing on a field or a court or whatever you're playing on, that's not mm-hmm. really always a place you can be loving on. Like, you obviously had to learn that too over time. Like there's not much love on the court you can really have. But how <laughs> have you learned to kind of separate that or have you even learned at this point yet to like separate how to balance mm-hmm. when you're off the court compared to on the court? I ain't gonna lie, man. It, it's hard. But like <laughs> one thing, how I look at it is like, basketball is my escape from life you know like mm-hmm. basketball is what makes me happy you know like my life can be complete hell like it can be destroying right in front of me like when I get on that court it's nothing more beautiful than playing basketball you know like basketball is like poetry you know like you just out there doing what you do like you got to just go out there and perform and like when I get out there like I feel like the person I am now, like, I can show more emotion. Like, I used to be emotional in this because, like, I used to be scared of how people view me if I showed emotion, you know. But, like, 
people love emotion. You know, like they love a person that's passionate about what they do. They love somebody that's passionate about the game. And like, I feel like that's the biggest thing that I learned. Like, you got to be more passionate about what you love, like, and be passionate about the game. So, like, I'm more passionate about the game now. Like, just everything that I've been through in life, you know, like, I feel like that I'm maturing at the right time. You know, like, I feel like that everything that I've been through in my life is for a reason. So, like, I'm just growing and, like, I'm learning to put put basketball and my outside life. Like, those are two different things. Like, when I'm on that court, it's only about getting better and going out there and kill, you know, like, Whatever's happening outside of life, you deal with that later. But like you just gotta deal with basketball right now while you're here. So that's how I separate it. This whole recruiting journey is obviously chaotic and obviously time-wise, we're gonna skip around a little bit. So we're gonna come under that whole section in a second. But we hop into your mm-hmm. senior year then. At that point, you technically were committed, but you go through the senior yep. year, and obviously I can imagine your goal was let's go back to back, let's win state championship back to back. You don't get that mm-hmm. goal, but at the end of the day, you get get Mississippi Garrett play of the year, which obviously is huge for you. You get to be a part of the Jordan Brand Classic. Like you really get to achieve things that many kids, no matter where you're in this country, don't get to achieve. And then mm-hmm. you also get to do it from where you're at. So walk us that yep. senior year, though, just what that was like experiencing all those great things. Um, my senior year this summer, I decommitted from Kentucky. So mm-hmm. <laughs> that was a crazy little year for me, man. Like as soon as I decommitted, like people telling me like if you like you suck like this and that like you'll never be nothing you're a bum you know so like that kind of motivated me you know like going to my senior I'm like okay I'm proving everybody just down me wrong you know like like I accepted the villain role you know like like kind of how like LeBron was in Miami like I did something that wasn't popular you know like ain't nobody ever decommit from Kentucky you know so like I was the first to ever do that you know like I kind of liked it, you know, like it, it gave me motivation. Like it made me like, it made me to go get better. Like I'm working on my jump shot. Like I'm working on my game, you know, like I feel like I think my first game, we was playing a team named Bahia and like, it was a pretty good game, but like I got into it with like this dude and his fans. And like, like I feel like all that motivation, like that whole, my whole senior year, like I was close to like getting the fight with everybody. Like, like my uncle was telling me, like, DJ, like, what are you doing? Like, you're not even trying to play basketball right now. It, and I feel like, like, emotionally, like, I feel like, you know, like, people were down to me. So, like, that passion that I was playing with, like, it was just, like, I'm just letting it out, you know? Like, if, if a person was me or, like, you know, belittle me or something, like, it just made me, like, feel like that I got to overreact to it. But, like, I just learned, like, I learned later on in my senior, just let my game speak for itself. And then, like, we made that little state championship run and then just came up short. You know, like, sometimes you come up short and, like, I don't know. It's still, like, it still bothers me to this day that I didn't get two state championships. You know, like, it's hard for me to even watch that game now, like, because I know that, like, we were this close. So, like, it's. If I can go back and change anything, I'll go back and play that state championship game again just to win. I know there was also one huge game you had. I'm not sure exactly when it took place, but you had a 51-point outing at some point that senior year. Take us yeah, to that yeah. night. I forgot about that. I'm, I'm glad you remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> my 51-point night, like, just like, that was the night, like, where all my hard work, all my shooting in the gym late at night, like, all that came in, like, I literally felt like I couldn't miss. Like, I feel like everything that I shot, like, was going in. Like, the, the, um, what's that? Like, I don't know if it's a metaphor or whatever, but, like, you know how they say, like, the basket was wide. Like, it literally mm-hmm. felt like it was wide for me. Like, I feel like every, I could shoot with my, like, I feel like I could shoot with my eyes going down. Like, like, that's how crazy of a night I was having. And, like, that little tear that I was on from, like, the beginning of the year to, like, the city of Palm, like, it was the best basketball of my life. You know, like, I just, I felt like that, like, I was growing as a basketball player. Like, I was growing as a young man. Like, I was maturing, you know, like, I was committed to Memphis. So, like, the hype around Memphis, like, you know, we had number one recruiting class. So, like, it was just so much leading up to that. Like, you know, I was I was just proud of all the things that I accomplished in my life, you know, and, like, I was just letting it all out. So. Now, in terms of that Jordan Brand Classic game, you get to go play alongside and with some of the top players in that recruiting class. Take us to that experience. Like, what was mm-hmm. that like? I mean, Jordan Brand was pretty good. You know, like, I didn't play a lot that much, but, like, I had, like, seven points in 11 minutes. So, like, I was proud that I, 
you know, then get have a goose egg. But like just being around like future pros, like obviously guys like James, you know, guys like Trendon, Tyrese, um, who else in there? Boogie, you know, guys like Boogie, um, uh, Anthony Edwards, he yeah. was there. You know, guys like Isaiah Stewart and Vernon Carey, like just guys that I've been playing against all my life, you know, like just seeing that like I'm on it on their same level, you know, being there with them, like it was more of a shocker for me. Cause like like I always told you, like I never felt like I was like people didn't look at me like I was as good as them. So, you know, like just being there and actually playing in that game and like being able to do something for Mississippi, you know, like that made me like that made me feel great about myself. Like I feel like I should have been a Matt Dunn All American, but like things happen. But I was blessed to be a Jordan Brand All American. So like it was just a blessing to be there. You know, like it was a blessing to be there playing with guys. I think another guy was there with Rocket. Like mm-hmm. me and Rocket are teammates now. You know, like I I built a relationship with Rocket at Jordan Brand. You know, like this is my guy. So, you know, like just been a lifelong relationship with people that you've been playing with since you were younger. Like it was it was just an amazing journey. Out of all the guys in that locker room for the Jordan Brand Classic, who's the funniest one? Me. <laughs> Me without a doubt. I'm funny, man. I'm a funny guy. <laughs> I'm Absolutely. a funny guy. Well, let's get into that recruiting process because you end up having a pretty historic recruiting process when you just look at everything you achieved and were a part of throughout the process of the Kentucky and the Memphis commitment. So you always, like you mm-hmm. said, you originally commit to Kentucky. I know some people might have forgot about that at this point, but – that's the program yeah. that we know what Coach Cal Poly's done. He's obviously one of the best coaches in the country, has got a long mm-hmm. track record of NBA guys. So, obviously, you make the decision. Yep. You originally commit to Kentucky. Why did? Why mm-hmm. was it the decision? Like, why do you feel like at that point in time, that's where you wanted to play college basketball at? Man, I ain't going to lie. Like, just the way Cal was recruiting me, you know, like, he used to come down and see me almost every week. You know, like, he was letting me, like, Cal kept it real with me. He was like, you like, you come here and you do this, like you perform, like you don't go to the NBA. Like, mm-hmm. and that's where I wanted to be. And, you know, like seeing how many one and dones like came out of Kentucky, like that was no brain to me. Like I felt like coming into college, I wanted to be a no, like I wouldn't tell nobody that I was one and done, but like mm-hmm. I wanted to be a one and done, you know, like yeah. I was I was cool with like however long it take it take, you know, but like originally like going to Kentucky, I was like, I'm gonna be a one and done. Cause, like I know that like don't get out of there you know, keep bringing in some more guys that like, you're going to fall into that trend where, like, you might not play. So, like, mm-hmm. I was just, like, it was more of, a, like, a momentum thing. Like, Cal, like, watching Cal and Memphis team, like, Coach Calipari is coming to my house trying to recruit me, you know, like, yep. it was, like, a bittersweet moment. Like, I, I felt like a little kid again. Like, I was, like, it's, like, this is crazy to me, you know? So, like, I just say, like, I, it was kind of an end-of-moment decision, you know, like, I was like, hey, I'm doing good right now. Like, I'm happy. Like, why not? You know, so, like, that's kind of why I did it. So what led and what kind of happened after that point to the point you committed? Because as we just talked about, like, this is Cal Poly, this is Kentucky. Like, the track record mm-hmm. is there to go to the NBA, one done, possibly two years. Like, the history is there. He's done that. You also grew up watching his school. So, and you know, no mm-hmm. one's ever done it before. Like, no one's ever decommit from Cal Poly at that point in time. So yep. what happened? Like, why did you decide to eventually decommit from Kentucky? And what led to that? I ain't going to lie, man. Like, I was hearing rumors about Penny getting a job, you know, in Memphis. And, you know, Kentucky said seven hours away from me. And I'm not going to lie. I'm a big family guy. And mm-hmm. I, at the time, where I was mentally is I wasn't ready to leave. You know, like, I need to be close to home. And, like, so I told – I was basically telling him, like, I just – you know, I need to reconsider. You know, like, I need to, like, look at my options, you know, because, like, I don't want to go in there. Like, I don't want to commit to something, but I know if I'm not, like, I'm unsure. So, like, I was like, let me, like, let me just sit down and think about my decision and see what I wanted to do. And, like, that's why I ended up decommitting because, like, I knew I was going to be me seven hours away from home, you know? And, like, that's kind of why. That's, that's the real, like, that's the big reason why I didn't go because, like, it was too far. So how did he take that? And I know we hear sometimes, it's not uncommon, like, we see people decommit from programs, but... At that point, you uh-huh. were the first guy to do that. So how did he take that in? Just how did the relationship go from the point you told him that to obviously after that? Well, I didn't get to talk to him. I was I talked to Tony Barber. So, like, mm-hmm. Tony was telling me, he was like, DJ, like, you know, if you do this, you do that. Like, he would tell me to backfire of it. Like, what would happen? I was like, I really don't care. You know, like, 
Mm-hmm. Like it's just words. Like people, like as long as they don't harm me physically, I'm cool. You know, like I was worried about nobody saying that. Like mm-hmm. people, people threaten you all the time. People say people had their opinions. So like whatever they said didn't matter to me. I didn't care. Like I know it in like what type of person I am. Like I know who I am, so I'm comfortable with myself. So. I didn't get to talk to Cal, and like I, don't, I still don't to this day know his true feelings about it. So like, I called him, and you know, I didn't get no answer. So like, I just had to talk to Tony Barra about it. So I really don't know his true feelings about it. You know, I probably never will know. So it was it. So have you ever thought like, what if I decided to go out there? What if I did play my freshman year out there, possibly sophomore year? Who knows how long it would have been? But have you ever thought mm-hmm. about that and going back and saying, what if I did go there? I mean, of course you have your what ifs, but you know, mm-hmm. like, like I've been saying, like, everything happens for a reason, you know? So, yep. like, it was a reason why I didn't go out there, you know? It was a reason why things happened to me at Memphis, you know? Like, it's a reason for everything. So, like, I'm not going to sit here and, and dwell on my decision, you know? Because, like, at the end of the day, I got to live with every decision I made in life. So, mm-hmm. at the end result, is on me. Like, it's, it's just on me what I got, what I'm going to do with it. So, like, I just got to fulfill my dreams and I got to move on with life. Like, yeah, I should. Yeah, I feel like I could have been in the NBA if I was in Kentucky, but like, I didn't do it. So, you know, like, just got to move on, got to move forward in life. Like, I'm not going to beat myself up about it. You know, mm-hmm. like, I'm not going to beat myself up about it. But like, I would say part of me thinks about it sometimes. So then obviously that puts you back on the open market. You're back out there looking for your new college to go to. And as you said, ultimately, you want to be somewhere close to home. Penny gets the job yeah. in Memphis then, and at that point, he rebuilds this roster where they weren't necessarily, a, per se, a horrible school at that point, but obviously it wasn't mm-hmm. Memphis standards. It wasn't where Coach Calpari had them at one point. So he comes yeah. in there, and you guys end up having a historic program recruiting class, not just program-wise, but in terms of his country-wise. Number one overall, mm-hmm. James Wiseman, yeah. Precious, yourself, Boogie, the list goes on, guys. Walk us through how this all kind of unfolded. Like, How did you ultimately decide to say, I want to go to Memphis, and how did you guys all team to form that super class? Well, I'm not going to lie. Originally, it was, you know, Malcolm Dandrew was the first one to be committed there. And, you know, I came right after him, you know. So the biggest thing with Nick was to get James. And, you know, once James committed, like, all the dominoes started to fall. You know, we got – I don't know who committed first. It was Lester or Damian. I think I think it was Lester. Mm-hmm. So Lester came, and then Damian committed, and then Boogie was committed to Duke at the time. So. He decommitted, you know, he DM me, he hit me up. He was like, hey, yo, he was like, bro, like, I decommitted. I was like, the best move is Memphis. Like, <laughs> yeah, come, come to Memphis, you know. Then I guess him and James were talking. You know, James got him to come to Memphis. And then I didn't know, I didn't think Pritchard was coming, you know. But, like, when Pritchard came, I was like, well, damn, like, we're we going to be pretty good, you know. So, like, after that, like, all the, like, the media, everybody, like, the spotlight was on us. Like, I think it was seven of us. Yeah, it was seven of us. Like, we was the big, like, we came to college, like, the college eyes on Memphis. And, you know, like, it was crazy. It was just crazy to be a part of, you know, like, cause, like everybody and their mama, like, oh, man, y'all winning the national championship. Y'all doing this, y'all doing that. And, you know, like, it was just crazy. Now, that freshman year, things obviously go crazy with a lot of stuff right out the gate. But before all this yep. starts happening with James and everything starts unfolding that way, you guys all get on campus. You guys have this number one ranked recruiting class. Obviously, as a coach by Penny Hardaway in his very first coaching year out there, he's kind of learning the ropes of everything. Just how are you guys looking in preseason? Like, as a team, what did the team look like and what were your guys' expectations and, like, what you guys truly believed in was going to happen that year? I mean, we felt like we felt like we was good enough to win that championship. You know, like, we felt like we had the pieces. Like, of course, we was young because, like, we brought in seven freshmen, so, like, we was young, you know, like we felt like we just had the pieces to to do what we do. Like, I still feel like if we would have had James, you know, like the COVID hit, didn't it? COVID hit. So COVID mm-hmm. messed us up. But like I feel like if we would have had James, you know, like we would have had our full team. Like I feel like the sky was the limit for us. You know, like like obviously things happen for a reason, but like if we would have had our full team, like I feel like we could have won. Like if it wasn't no COVID, I feel like we would have won the next championship. That's how I feel. And we look at all you guys, you guys are all highly ranked regarded players. James obviously was the highest of you guys, number one in the country on all sides. But you guys all mm-hmm. kind of had the goal. Obviously, you said every player does want to go one and done, two and like your mm-hmm. ultimate goal is find the NBA. But 
you guys all get this yep. opportunity where you guys don't have to split roles. You guys aren't all going to get the spotlight right away. How did you guys accept mm-hmm. that? Was there any problem that locker room trying to figure out like, well, I just was the go-to guy in my high school and not to accept a role. Like how'd you guys buy into that? Mm-hmm. And did you guys even all buy into that? I mean, I'll say coming in, we all talked about sacrifice. Like we all talked about like, cause ultimately you got to sacrifice. Like yeah, I knew I wasn't going to get my 30 shots a game. Like James <laughs> knew he wasn't going to get this. Like, you know, like ultimately, like we knew we had to sacrifice some. So like I was cool with sacrifice, you know, cause like it's bigger than just me. You know, like I was looking for the team. Like, I was looking for winning. Like it was bigger, like, cause I'm, I grew up in the Memphis area. So like I knew how happy Memphis was to finally have like a great team again, you know? So like, mm-hmm. I just want to do something special for Memphis, you know, like, of course you're going to go through, like we're young. So like, we're going to go through our time, but like things not going our way. We be like, man, like, I feel like I can do this. I feel like I can do that. Like, I feel like he's doing this to me, you know, like, it's all like, I just feel like, you know, we grew, we grew, like, we grew through everything that we went through, you know, like, we had our little freshman bumps and, you know, it was just, it was a big adjustment because college, college basketball is hard, you know, like, it's a, it's a different level, like, you go playing against grown men, you know, like, it's not like going out there and, like, we're playing AAU, like, it's not AAU, like, it's, <laughs> These guys, like, they trying to get to where you trying to get to, too. You know, like, they not, they don't care about no seven freshmen coming in talking about, like, we this, we that. Like, they don't care about that. Like, they life the lines on the life, on the, on the lines just like ours. So, like, our biggest thing was, like, we was young, but, like, we didn't have no veterans, like, to teach us the ropes of the game. Like, we had to, every day we went through, we had to learn on the fly. Like, we learned on the fly. Like, you, yo, yo error from mistakes was slow. Like, you know, like, you couldn't make no mistakes and be like, oh, that's a freshman mistake. Like, no, nah, you're not, a, like, you know, like, you out here playing, like, you, you gotta, like, you gotta be perfect, but, like, realistically, you can't be perfect as a freshman. So, it was kind of, I'd say it was a horror for all of us to adjust, but, like, once we finally adjusted, we was good. In terms of Coach Hardway, obviously, like we said, he, that was his first year coaching, so he obviously has mm-hmm. ups and downs like any first year coach would be. How is he adjusting this? Because you guys have a bunch of freshmen. None of you guys know what you guys are necessarily doing yet. He's still learning what to do. He doesn't know exactly what to do, specifically at least yet. So how did you guys get together? And was that kind of a problem, like just not having anyone in there that really knew what was kind of no one really had experience from the coaching staff to you guys? Like with Penny, like it was like he was trying to be patient, but, you know, like Penny likes to win. Like he he don't like to lose. So like. When we'll go through streets where we'll lose or like something bad to happen, like he's frustrated, but like, like at the same time, like he understands, like we're young. Like he he not telling us that we're young, but you know, like we know that he's like trying to be patient with us because like mm-hmm. it's hard to win with freshmen, you know, like we got a couple of upperclassmen, like at the time, like guys like Alo and Tyler, like they only got one year of experience in college. So like, you know, like we really like we're young, you know, like we don't got nobody like that really just been playing college basketball for that long. So, like, we was a young team. So, like, his biggest thing was, like, trying to be patient with us. And, you know, like, I feel like I don't even remember that freshman season, really. Like, mm-hmm. I remember, like, when James couldn't play, like, I feel like we went, like, 12. Like, we lost Oregon. So, like, I feel like we won, like, 11 straight games. After that. And then I forgot who we lost to. I think Georgia. And then, like, Things started, you know, we got in the coverage play and things started to go, you know, down here from that because, like, we was young. Like, we didn't we didn't have no veteran. We really didn't have no leaders like that. So, like, we were just learning on the fly. And, you know, like, I can tell it was a frustrating time with Coach. He's so used to winning, you know, like, he don't like to lose. And, like, he was just – he was just trying to be patient. And then, like, I got hurt my first meal. So, like, it was kind of hard for us because, like, we had to adjust that way too. So, like – he, he was just trying to – his biggest thing was just being patient with it. As we know, especially – I mean, inside of a locker room, I can't necessarily think this, but when you're talking about from the outside perspective, media-wise, you guys had James mm-hmm. Wiseman. He was the number one player and was the number one pick in the draft, rightfully so, because he's just yeah. such a dominant force. Like, the very – the freshman – I mean, there's some guards. Like Jalen Suggs is saying, Cade. Like there's some guards that can play great as a freshman, but the ones mm-hmm. that typically can dominate a game and can help win games are the dominant freaks in nature, the DeAndre and the Marvin Bagley's, the Zion's. James, like yep. those guys are the guys you guys mm-hmm. kind of built your offense around, pretty much did everything around because he could dominate any level, no matter what age there is. So take us through all this happening. He doesn't only get a couple of games with him, but 
as that all unfolded, the whole situation has had the tension of media now, all pressure on you guys, investigation stuff, like all this stuff's happening now. How did you personally deal with that? And just how much did that affect the team going forward, having to handle all that stuff early on? I mean, we it was hard for us because, like, uh, originally we was in the locker room. We was always expecting James to play, you know, like, Mm-hmm. Time is so steady, like running down, running down. Like somebody, somebody looked on their phone. They were like, "Bro, James is ineligible." Like I'm like, "We like what?" You know, like we didn't understand why. You know, like we're all kids. You know, at the end of the day, like we just want to play basketball. You know, like in space for James, like it was hard for him. Like just watching him had to sit down and like not be able to like experience college for real. You know, like mm-hmm. he played like his first two games. Like they was crazy. Like. I feel like, what did he do? I think he had, like, 28 his first game or something yeah. like that. Like, yeah, like, his first game was crazy. Like, just watching him, like, what he did. Like, he did that, like, it felt like he wasn't even, like, trying for real. Like, you know, like, the game just came so easy to him. Like, he was running the floor, dunking, blocking shots. Like, just being James, you know, and, like, watching, just seeing him as a kid, like, having the game taken away from him. Like, it devastated him, you know, and, like, I still to this day don't really like I don't fault them for his decision. Like I know it's hard, you know, like you deserve to be playing. So like mm-hmm. I don't fault him to this day, cause like at the end of the day, he's still out there playing basketball. And like I know it, I know like he wished he could have played his freshman year. So like it hurt me knowing that he couldn't play because like he deserved to play, you know, but things happen, you know. So y'all found out he was ineligible, not from like coaches or anyone, you just found out from your someone's phone. Yeah, Boogie looked on his phone and saw it. And then, of course, Coach came in later on and told us about it. But, like, it was just crazy, man. Cause, like, we saw it on his face. Like, he was devastated. You know, like, it, mm-hmm. it was hard for him. Like, his whole mood changed out there. Like, he was just – he was down. Because, like, they took they took what he loved away from him. Like, they took basketball away from him. So, like, it was just sad. But, like, we we did everything for him. Like, did the whole little way he was out. Like, we were dedicated to him because, like, we knew that he wanted to be there. We knew he wanted to play in those games. So, like, we was winning for him. But so, like, it was just hard. It was hard, really. So overall, you guys still have a pretty solid season, 21-10 as a group. You end up having mm-hmm. some pretty good games as well, 13-19 starts. You missed the final 12 games of the season due to knee injury. But walk us through that yep. for you. Like, once James goes down, obviously now people are going to have to start doing Like, the offense has changed quite a bit. You guys have more opportunity. And we saw you end up averaging mm-hmm. 11 points a game, four rebounds steal and a half of one block per game. Take us through that freshman yeah. season. Like, how did you see yourself grow? And just what was that freshman year like for you personally? Um, My freshman year for me, like, I feel like, I feel like it was a great, great year for me. You know, like, of course, I had my ups and downs. But, like, when James went out, like, we all knew we had to step up. And I think Leslie got hurt, too. So, like, mm-hmm. we really had to step up then because, like, we were short. So, like, me just, me just coming in, like, I knew I had to do more, like, I couldn't, like, I finally felt like I could be, like, a little bit of me. Like, I was in high school. Like, I was able to score a little more. I was able to do this and that. But, like, it was just their first year. Like, it was, it was, it had a lot of ups and downs for me. You know, like, I had my great moments. And then I had my moments where, like, like, damn, like, I'm tripping. You know, like, like I know I'm way better than this. You know, so, like, first many year was definitely up and down. But, like. A guy, a guy that I was glad like to see doing great, but like Precious, cause like originally Precious struggled, you know, the first couple of games, you know, and like just seeing like him go out there and lead the American in double doubles, and you know, just seeing all the things that he, like seeing how much he sacrificed and worked hard for, like I was just more proud of the person he was becoming, the year he was having, cause like he worked so hard for that, you know, and like I'm still like that's my guy to this day, so like I'm glad everything Precious got, he worked for, you know, so like. It was just it was just crazy for me seeing how he adjusted to the game and like started dominating. Like he was getting like fifteen and twelve easily, like mm-hmm. back to back to back. You know, like it was crazy. So like I was more like I was proud of him. You know, cause like he deserved it. You know, like he deserved it because he worked so hard. Like he did everything the right way. So like despite my first year, you know, I was proud of all he did. He knows when Lester came back, Lester did his thing too. So like. Just seeing those guys, like, you know, guys like, like, just guys in my own recruiting class grow up. Like, all of us grew up there. So, like, I was just proud that all of us were growing up. And even the guys that were there, they were growing up in a sense, too. So. Now, a couple last things before about that freshman season, one of which is, obviously, we know James went number one pick in the draft. He's just going to be just fine out there in Golden State. 
Then you also got Precious, mm-hmm. who just got traded out there to Toronto. We know what he's capable of. We saw Flash out there in Miami. But both those guys yeah. were practicing for a little bit of time. Obviously, the more developed Precious on the second half of the year wasn't necessarily there with James. But those two guys going mm-hmm. at it, both guys are insane freshman talents. What were those two like one-on-one? And who got the better of each other when they were playing one-on-one in practice? Uh, it was it was great to see, you know, like you, you just like you, there's something you'll pay to see. Like those guys will go at it, but like I wouldn't really say nobody really got the best of each other. You know, like mm-hmm. they was like they both were competing, but you know, James is James, Prince is Prince. So like yep. we knew that both of them, like they was going, they was gonna get their own. Like they was gonna compete with each other, but like they was gonna get their own. So like just playing with like just being able to say like you play with guys like that, like. That's something that forever live with me for the rest of my life. Cause you know, like I wasn't put I'm not supposed to be there, you know, like I'm not where where I come from, like, you know, for guys like us to make it. So, you know, it's just a blessing. It was a blessing to be in the presence of guys like Penny, you know, James. Like, like it was just a blessing to be at the university of you know, like that's something I'll never take for granted. You know, cause like I, it was a point when I decommitted from Kentucky, like I didn't know you know, what I was going to do next. Like, I didn't I didn't know if I ever made it to the NBA, you know. So, like, it was just a blessing for me, you know, just to be around people like that. So, yeah. And my last month that freshman year is, you guys, before the season got going, you guys took the trip out to Bahamas. Obviously, I was back before COVID stuff happened, so teams could take mm-hmm. those trips more often. And those, I know those, every team loves taking those trips. So, what was that like? You go out to the Bahamas, a whole bunch of you guys freshmen, everyone's been together in this recruiting process. What was it like going out there to the Bahamas with each other? Mm-hmm. Oh man, the Bahamas, man, like it was crazy. Like we we all was gelling well. Like we all everybody was playing well. Like I think I led the team in scoring down there. You know, like everybody was having fun. Like we was all we were just happy. Like we we was bonding, you know, like it just gave us that momentum of going into the season. Like we can really do this, you know, like we can really do something special. We all be together. Like we didn't even have James and Precious. So like and we were still like dominating. So like we felt like once we get those two, like the sky's the limit for us. So, like, that Bahamas trip was great. Like, I think we're going to the Bahamas this year at Mississippi State. Like, I, I definitely will advise people to go to the Bahamas. Like, the Bahamas was fun. So, I was great. I was definitely grateful to be going out of the state because, like, I ain't never been out of America before. So, like, it was just great for me. Like, you know, that was my first time ever being somewhere other than, like, you know, California and stuff like that. So, it was different. Like, it was, it was a great experience. And that sophomore year was last year, and everything goes chaotic between the COVID pandemic that obviously locks everyone out from pretty much affects every college season, obviously, as you guys all experience. But a lot of shifting happened mm-hmm. in the roster. Technically, you guys don't necessarily lose James, but he goes to the NBA. Precious, obviously, is a huge loss. He moves on. A lot of this stuff just happens within different changes and locker room stuff happens. But how did you guys get ready for that sophomore year? Because this is your big jump season now. You're supposed to – I can imagine you probably were expecting a lot bigger role and whatnot. Walk us through this yep. whole sophomore season is how you were expecting it to go before the year started. Um, just me expecting to come in, like, I'll say, I'll say I put a lot of pressure on myself. You know, like, mm-hmm. I saw that, like, I had a great freshman year, you know, and, like, I told myself come back. Like, I worked so hard to get back from that injury, you know, I told you last year at college. So, like, mm-hmm. I had that in my mindset already that, like, I was going to the league and, like, I I put too much pressure on myself, you know, like like going out there my first game, like everything I was trying to do, like I would feel like I got to like go out here and drop 30 for me to go to the NBA. Like, you know, I was being a little kid, you know, like I feel like mentally I was my parent that year, you know, like I feel like everything that I went to that year helped me grow to the person I am today. Like, yeah, it was a tough year. Like, yeah, towards the end, I finally found myself, but like, my biggest thing was like mentally, like I was messed up mentally, you know, like as a team, like you can tell, like I can tell as a team, like we always messed up, you know, like like it's hard going out there playing with no fans, you know, like, like believe it or not, like those fans showing up to those games, like they give you a certain type of energy, like it give you like, like you be hyped to go out there and show out for those people, like, you know, like, and just having to deal with like, artificial noise and like not seeing nobody in the stands like he's like man, like last year was the hardest like that's the hardest time basketball ever in my life like I couldn't have fans like I couldn't look at my mom or dad you know my grandma for motivation to help me you know like it was just it was a hard year so like 
I would just say to answer your question, like mentally, I feel like a lot of us, like mentally, you you was messed up mentally, you know. So like, that's why the season didn't go like in my eyes. Well, obviously we won the NIT championship, but like mm-hmm. mentally, we could we could have been way better if we would have like if things could have went better mentally for us. Like we could have been way better, but like things happen, you know. And we look at you personally, I mean, you kind of touched up on it, but you head into the year preseason, all AAC second team because of your great mm-hmm. freshman season. Obviously, everyone kind of expected, OK, pressure's gone. These guys are gone. You're going to step into that, that forward role. You're going to be the dominant go to guy, at least one of those guys. And like you said, yep. you even have the expectations like I could have a chance to go to the NBA. And I know a lot of guys make that decision sometimes it kind of focus too much on it at different points. So when you mm-hmm. start going through that process and then you end up going to the bench for a little bit of your season for midway through halfway through the year or whatnot. How did you personally mm-hmm. handle that? Like, did that affect you in a negative way? Did that motivate you more? Like, how did that shift your mm-hmm. mindset when you went from saying, I'm the final year of college basketball to going to the NBA to now sitting on the bench in different games? I'm not going to lie. It affected me. Like, it affected me like crazy. Like, like it was a time where I was like, man, I don't even know if I want to play basketball no more. You know, like, mm-hmm. mentally, I was messed up, you know. But, like, at the same time, I couldn't quit on my team, you know, like, my loyalty and like my love for that city, their love for Penny, like love for like my teammates, like I couldn't clock out on them, you know, like no matter how hard basketball got for me, like no matter how hard that I wanted to quit or I wanted to give up, like I owe, like I gave them my commitment to be there. So, you know, like it was hard for me because like at times I didn't know, like I didn't know what I was going to do this night. Like I didn't know if I was going to play this night. Like I didn't know if I was going to, find my niche and you know like a part of it was on me like instead of like working harder or like you know get myself out of like letting people know what was going on with me mentally like I kind of just dealt with it you know like I kind of just sat there and like act like everything was okay but deep down knowing I wasn't okay you know like I feel like I could open up more you know like even like my meeting leaving like I told coach like, I feel like it's a lot I could have did better you know I told him like I could have talked to you more. Like, I could have did this. Like, I could have did that. Like, it's a lot I could have did to fix how, you know, my sophomore year went. But, like, I just didn't, like, I wasn't, I wasn't talking to God like that a lot. You know, like, I, like I was losing myself, you know. Like, I felt like I wasn't myself. And so I just felt like I need something new, you know. Like, but I did, I did remember my last conversation with my grandma right before the covers tournament, like when stuff started turning around for me, she was like, she was like, just go out there and like be you, like go play, play your game. Like, like, you know, like, yeah, the year didn't go like you wanted to, like, yeah, your expectations is failed, but like, keep going, you know, like always remain true to yourself. Like, you know, like go out there and like prove to people who you are. So, you know, like they kind of stuck with me and like I started finding my niche and like slowly but surely, like I started getting back to myself, and, you know, like, it was just, it was a relief because, you know, like, that was a hard year for me, but it was a tough year. And, you know, I'm just blessed. I'm blessed that I made out of, you know, because, like, mentally I could I could have quit basketball. Like, mentally I could have checked out. But, like, they gave me a little motivation, like, to get better, to do better. So, like, that's how I explain it. That's why I think the NIT championship is huge. And, obviously, other fan bases go around. Obviously, they might make fun of different stuff like that. but those that truly look mm-hmm. back at it, like from people that truly know what happened last year in terms of how difficult it was, like any, anyway, especially, I mean, especially yeah. obviously all the applause to Gonzaga and Baylor for making it that far, but every team had to deal mm-hmm. with stuff that hopefully no one ever has to deal with again in terms of the pandemic, the no fans, the yeah. losing guys, not knowing mm-hmm. who's going to play, personal battles, like the list goes on different stuff that happened last year. And you guys were able to mm-hmm. turn your season around. No, it wasn't in the NCAA tournament, but you guys start winning games. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. You guys play a great team in Mississippi State who, Obviously, it's not your team, but walk us through mm-hmm. how big that was for you, not just you, but as a team, like to go out there, win a championship still at NIT after all the season, everything that happened this year. Mm-hmm. Originally, we didn't like, did none of us want to go play? You know, like mm-hmm. when we found out we weren't going to the NCAA tournament, like all of us immensely checked out. You know, like all of us, like, man, I'm not going to lie because we don't want to go. Like, we don't want to do this. Like, we didn't want to be there, you know, like we felt like we failed, you know, but like once we got there and once we started playing, like we all realized that we might as well win, like we here, you know, like we might as well do something good, like 
coach was telling us, like, it's for the city, you know, like, it's for Memphis, you know, like, either way it goes, it's only going to be two champions at the end of the year. Like, it's going to obviously Baylor, and then we won. So, like, we won. At the end of the day, it might not have been the the NCAA double-A championship, but, like, we won NIT. You know, we won a championship. So, it's like, that's forever going to be in the banners. Like, that's going to forever go down in records. Like, yeah, it wasn't what we wanted to be, but, like, what we went through this season and, like, finally, like, actually winning something, like, that made us, like, this show is, like, this year we can do something special. And, like, obviously, you know, they got the team they got this year. So, like, you know, they expect them to do great things. And, like, me here at Mississippi State, we expect them to do great things here. So, like, it's, I feel like we won at the end of the day, my sophomore year, the win the NIT championship. I'll just skip ahead a little bit. And we talked about what happens if you play Memphis in terms of going up against the Lawsons again. But obviously, mm-hmm. it's your old team. I'm sure there'd be a little bit of pride. There'd be a little bit of extra motivation if you got to go up against them again. And I think both mm-hmm. of you guys should be locks going to the NCAA tournament. Memphis well, should be a top one, two seed. I think you guys would be a top two to three seed, possibly in the, in the one seed, two guys on a tough conference this year. But you look mm-hmm. at all this pot potential. Like if you guys get a matchup against them in the NCAA tournament this upcoming year, any point of the year, to be honest. How different yeah. and how special would that game be for you? I mean, it'll, it'll definitely be special for me, you know, because it's playing against, like, it's playing against my my lifelong, like, my lifelong friends, you know, like, guys that regardless of what we do at the basketball, like, those are going to be my guys regardless. So, like, it's going to be a competitive game. But, like, at the end of the day, we got to put aside, or, like, their brothers, like, we brothers, we brothers off the court, but like when mm-hmm. we play, like we go on the war, you know, like I know they're gonna be coming in my neck and I'm be coming at their neck just like they are coming in mine. Like, don't nobody wanna lose, you know, like we all playing for something, and, you know, like I definitely wanna see that matchup, you know, like I definitely wanna play against them because, you know, like all the great players they got down there, you know, like mm-hmm. I feel like it'll be a fun game, but like only time will tell. Like if, if it happens, it happens. If not, then, you know. We only can wish, but, like, we just had to see. So take us through this whole portal process. We know every player kind of starts getting kind of pretty positive that's going to happen where you guys can just go transfer and not just sit out. About midway through the mm-hmm. year, it becomes official right after the season's done. But what's going through yeah. your mind personally? We know this whole Memphis team is a pretty much a whole new look team compared to last year. You personally, mm-hmm. though, like, at what point did you make up your mind and say, you know, I like this place to a degree, but I want to move on. I need to go somewhere else now, like, when did you make that up in your mind? Decide you want to go to the portal. Um, not gonna lie, I had it in my mind early in the year, but like, mm-hmm. like I wanted to be like I couldn't, I couldn't give up on my brother and stuff like that. I was like, I'm just dug it out, you know, like I'm just fight it out for them. And then, I just feel like I mentally I need a fresh start, you know, like, like a lot of people will say I'm running, I ran away from my problem and stuff like that. But like, I just felt like I outgrew environment you know like i feel like i grew Memphis. like mm-hmm. it was bigger than just basketball you know like i'm at home you know like people people that know me like people that that i've been around all my life like they got easy access to me like they can be around me, you know like mentally when you messed up like you start to do things that you that you don't you know you're not supposed to be doing you know like i just want to separate myself from all the bs in my life you know and like be able to like lock in like because i feel like i can i can't lock in and if like i can't hear you know like mm-hmm. i'm really like focused like it's not it's nothing to do you know like if you if you're not trying to get better here like then it's on you you know like i feel like i actually can focus on my goal and like get better and like actually pursue my dream you know like i ain't got no distraction like i ain't got to worry about Friends calling me, ask me for this, like, ask me, can they come over? Can they do that? Like, I ain't got to worry about nothing but, like, basketball. Like, I can finally, like, make D- make sure DJ good for for once, you know? Like, mm-hmm. like this decision that I made this time, like, it was a, I'd say it was a selfish decision, you know? Like, I made a decision for myself, you know? Like, I finally put myself before everybody else, and, you know? Like, and I don't regret that because, like, all my life, I always put people before me, so, like, Mm-hmm. I felt like I found doing something that made me happy deep down. So like, I I like, it was a, it's definitely it was a hard choice for me. Cause, you know, like Memphis is home. Like, I didn't left some great people. You know, like I didn't left all those guys. Like, they're my brothers for life. You know, like I didn't grow up with them. You know, like 
it was definitely hard leaving a lot of people in the city of Memphis that I left behind, but like I had to, you know, like and at the end of the day, they gonna forever be around, you know, like when I come back, those people that, that I care about and love, like they gonna be there for me. So, you know, like right now, you gotta do what's best for DJ, just like they doing what's best for them. You gotta do what's best for DJ. And we see the team they have put together now, and obviously the public probably doesn't know, but I mean, there's always rumblings of different guys like a potential reclass for Duran and Faith and some of the other mm-hmm. guys. Did that influence your yeah. impact or decision at all? Like, did knowing that you have got these guys possibly coming in and all these other guys are targeting too, like, did that impact your decision at all? Well, I didn't even like, I, I didn't hear nothing about the money and um, Jalen until like mm-hmm. I was committed to Mississippi State. So, like, even if I was in Memphis, like, I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't care about that. You know, like, at, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, there's help, you know, like, mm-hmm. I can help the money and I can help Jalen, like, I can teach them the ends and out of college basketball, but like that didn't, them coming didn't have anything to do with it. Like mm-hmm. I already had in my mind that like, regardless of what happened, like I got to do what's best with DJ, you know, like I got to do what's going to make DJ be successful. You know, like I had to be selfish for myself, you know, like and that's what I did. That's why I chose to um, leave, but like, I didn't know about, the money in Jalen until like I started seeing like around what was that like June or July or mm-hmm. all yeah, yeah. Like yeah when I was already gone like they were like they was about to reclassify and stuff like that so like I feel like it was great news for Memphis because like they needed that like you know that's another number one recruiting class so you know that's another hype that Memphis need especially after that year that we had last year you know like now they, they're feeling more confident you know like the fans are hype like they're, they're loving it so mm-hmm. it was definitely two big pickups for the city of Memphis. So why Mississippi State for you then? Obviously I can already imagine that you had a list full of schools reaching out to you have technically three mm-hmm. more years of eligibility available to you your guy just put up 10 points per game at least that in your first two seasons obviously had a great yeah. two-year run you had to have offers from all mm-hmm. different places across the country so why Mississippi State? Why was that the program where you said, this is what's best for me. This is where I want to go. Well, I'm not going to lie. Um, I always had a great relationship with this coaching staff. And, you know, like, I was comfortable with them. And, you know, and they, from since day one, they always told me, DJ, we're going to let you be you. So I was like, mm-hmm. I was like, why not? And then, I'm not going to lie, Garrison, Garrison Brooks was definitely a big factor in that. You know, like, me and him was talking. He was like, um, uh, he was telling me he thinking about transferring. He was like, I'm probably going to do a little grad year. So I was like, I like, bet, you know, like, I was like, I'm thinking about that too. He was like, I was like, where are you thinking about going? He was like, I'm not going to lie. Once I, once I um, enter the port, I'm going to get over. I'm going to Mississippi State, you know, because his dad was there. I was like, I was like, okay. So like, I was thinking about that. I was telling my parents, I was like, you know, Garrison thinking about going to Mississippi State, you know, like they are the head. Guys like Iverson, Tolu, um, DJ Stewart, you know, guys like that. And, you know, I was like, if me and Garrison come, like, this, this NCAA team. So, like, after that, I think DJ, um, he had a um, pretty name in draft. And I committed. I had committed. So, I was talking to Rocket because originally I didn't know I didn't know Shaquille at the time. And so, Shaquille committed and then. I was talking to Rocket, you know, like, hey, you know, like, you come to Mississippi State, bro, like, we're going to be straight. Like, I'm going to make sure you're good. Like, I'm going to make sure blah, 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 and this and that. You know, me and Rocket, we always been tight. You know, it's my, it's my dog. So, like, mm-hmm. he trusted me enough to come down here and come play with me, you know. So, like, we build a, like, you know, a national, I mean, an NCAA team, you know. Like, they kind of got us a sleeper. But, like, we got enough pieces to where, we can be successful, you know. You got guys like Cameron Matthews, mm-hmm. um, D. Found, and we got some really great freshmen. You know, like the freshmen are gonna be really great. Like we got guys like Keyshawn, Cam Carter, um, Apple White. You know, mm-hmm. and then like we just got we got enough pieces to where we can be good. You know, like it's on our biggest thing is us. You know, like however we like. The season depends on us, like what we do. You know, we got a, we got veterans because you know Garrison, he played one of the toughest leagues in the, in basketball. You know, Rocket played at Michigan State. Shaq mm-hmm. played in in the same league as Garrison. You know, I played against great teams. You know, so like 
we got the veterans, you know, it's just on us to go out there and do what we do. Cause you know, Iverson, he's a first team all SEC guy, you know, like he's proven, totally proven, you know. So like we just gotta go out there and do what we do. So out of all the other schools reaching out to you, did any of those other schools appeal to you? Like, and if so, who were they? Like, what other schools were you saying like you were really interested in? Um, I'm not gonna lie, I like Alabama mm-hmm. and I like um Texas and them because Buzz Williams, like me and Buzz just had a real good relationship, you know, like Buzz was a real dude. Like, like I told him, like coming into it, like I didn't care about being the man, like I didn't care about me, like I just wanted to know how would I grow. Like that was my biggest thing in my in this recruitment. Like I wanted to know how would I grow, you know. And obviously well, they had a great year, you know, like the way they play up and down, like this this is my style of play. Like I I love playing like that. Like they shoot a lot of threes, they get up and down, like they play <laughs> they play fun. So like they was definitely a treat to me. And like I just I didn't choose it because like I felt like in my heart, that's where Mississippi State was in my heart. And I felt like that was the right thing for me. So that's why I chose Mississippi State. Now you mentioned how special you like this team so far. And I have you guys right now inside the top 10, number nine. And Obviously, in terms of ceiling, like I said, it could be anywhere from a one, three, maybe even four. You never know he's going to miss games because the COVID still is going to be apply and whatnot. But yeah. when we talk about rosters top to bottom, you guys got Iris, and who should be a guy that's going to probably be first team, second team. He's going to probably average 15 plus a game. Toe just was mm-hmm. a SEC double double king. He's obviously a superstar type player. He could win. He could be SEC player of the year. Obviously, Garrison's already been an ACC caliber guy. He comes to SEC. Same thing. You're adding yourself, mm-hmm. Rocket. This list goes on, like you said. When you look at this talent, like how special are they? And You've been a part of the James Wiseman team. We saw that in Memphis. You've been a part of last year's yep. team. Like, how special is this mm-hmm. team compared to teams you know, you have seen and you've been a part of so far in your life? Um, it's a lot different, you know. Like, mm-hmm. we all um, like we all like different in our own way. Like, we're not all. We never were all highly talented, like five star, like top ten, top fifteen. You know, like I think I'm probably the highest person on the team. You know. Mm-hmm. So, like, we don't really, like, we don't care about the rankings. Like, we just here, like, we're here to play basketball. Like, you know, we're here to get better. Like, you know, like, we're not worried about the media, like, hyping us up. We're not worried about none of that. Like, it's a lot different. Like, we just here, like, focus on basketball. Like, we ain't got to worry about living up to a hype, you know. Like, of course, we got hype. Like, of course, Mississippi State fans want to see us do good. But, like, mm-hmm. we ain't got to worry about living up to no hype. We ain't got to worry about – um letting people down like it's really like this season is on us like whatever we do is on us like we got the ability to be great because like we all generally like we do we do things together like we all go out together like we build like we're bond together you know like and there's something like at Memphis like we really didn't do you know like mm. yeah we all mess with each other but like when it came down to hand uh, different like we just like we made a bond with each other and like no matter what we do, like we know that each one of us got each other back at the end of the day. Like we're gonna fight for each other. So you said that Coach Howen wants you to play you. He wants you to be you. And we saw flashes mm-hmm. that we talked about that back in high school. We know what you're capable of doing. Will you go out there and average 24 a game? Obviously, we don't know. Like we said, it's a stack team. Probably might not have the opportunity to score that much per game. But you being mm-hmm. free, you getting back in that scoring mode that we know you're capable of doing. What can we start yeah. from this year? Like what kind of jump and what kind of new DJ will we be seeing this upcoming season? Um, just a more like a more mature, under control, you know, like better player, you know, like the game of college basketball slowed down from last year, you know, like, but like the game is really like I'm playing at my own pace now, you know, like I'm playmaking, like I'm I know how to create my own shots, I'm creating shots for other, you know, like it's really me like developing into like an older version of me, you know, like mm-hmm. the DJ that they've been new, like I feel like I'm being better now, like I feel like I'm growing every aspect of my life, you know, like. I'm not going to put no pressure on myself and say that I'm going to be, you know, the SEC player of the year or, yeah. you know, yeah. stuff like that. But, like, I know that I'm going to do enough for me, like, you know, to be at least a candidate for that or, like, try to, you know, win an award or something like that, you know. But, like, my biggest thing is winning, you know, like getting to the NCAA tournament because, like, I was supposed to go my freshman year, but then I got hurt and COVID hit, you know, like, I want to I want to experience the tournament. so. That's my biggest thing. Like, I feel like I'm just a better overall player mentally. Like, you know, like, I always had the game. I always had everything else. It's just, like, 
me mentally getting confidence in myself and being able to go out there and just do it. So that's the biggest thing for me. Absolutely. A couple more things before I let you go. One of which is something I like wrapping up, mm-hmm. and that's talking about building a legacy for yourself. And ultimately, you know your next chapter now is coming at Mississippi State for however many years God's got you in store here for. But by the time you end up leaving yeah. someday down the road, what do you want to remember for for what you achieve both on and off the court at Mississippi State? Um, I just wanted to be remembered as a guy that went out there and gave it his all every each and every night, you know, like just you know, I'm a great, I'm a great person, you know, like, like I, like I've been telling you, man, I give, I put everybody else before me, you know, like I just want to, I'm, I just want to be known as a great teammate, you know, a great player, a great basketball player, you know, but I really don't know. I really don't know what my legacy would be like. That's a great course. Absolutely, man. We're going back into faith a little bit. Obviously we talk about that throughout the duration of this, but you look now at your entire journey, everything you've gone through from the very beginning to this point, where would you say is the mm-hmm. one biggest moment that you've seen God show up so far? Um, been a lot of moments, but I'll say I'm 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 gonna say what I went through last year. Mm-hmm. You know, like like just him him just showing me that like like no matter no matter what you go through in life, you know, like you just gotta keep going. Like you gotta keep keep. Persever- like persevering, like you got to keep going, like you got to keep reaching heights, like you just got to keep, you got to keep going, you know, like, because you don't go through times in life where, like you don't understand why you're going through it, but like God obviously got you going through it for a reason, you know, like he's just trying to either make you stronger or teach you a lesson at the end of the day, like everything you go through in life is for a reason, so I'm a firm believer that whatever happens, happens, you know, and like I just feel like that I've grown a lot in a small period of time, you know, since I lived Memphis until now, like, I feel like that I learned a lot, you know, like, no matter the people who know me or who knew me, you know, I'm a, I'm a totally different person for who I was, you know, when I, when I was in Memphis, you know, like, and that's just the biggest thing, like, just trying to get people to see that, you know, that you're growing up in life, like, that you actually doing better for yourself, like, you actually not, you're not settling for less, you know, like you're not, you're not just doing stuff just because you hurt, you know, you're not just doing stuff because like you, you lost in life, like you actually like putting responsibility to your actions and like fixing them, you know, like doing what you got to do. So like my biggest thing was just like getting stronger mentally, you know, like life is hard, but like if you're not strong mentally, you're going to fold every time. So like, I just thank God that I didn't fold last year, you know, and I just thank him that he put me through that. I was through what I went through last year because I know it's going to be harder times in my life coming up. So, you know, like, just a bump in the road. So you just got to keep going. That's the main thing that I learned. Like, just keep going, keep fighting. Now your platform's going to continue to grow. It's already got to this point from your college career, and it's going to continue to grow at this point and pro career, whether it be NBA, overseas, and whatever guys got in store for you from here on out. How do you want to impact this world? Like, is there something that you want to kind of have a message to people? Is there something you want to invest in and help people out? Like, what, where, what can you, what are you going to kind of want to do for God's kingdom going forward? Kind of looking forward to like, what's some of the things you want to do to, or maybe one specific thing you kind of want to help the impact this world by or impact God's kingdom by and spreading his light? Um, my grandma had always told me, she was like, DJ, I feel like, you know, your purpose is bigger than basketball, you know? Mm-hmm. So like, I feel like everything that I've been through in life and everything that I've that's transpired in my life, you know, I feel like that I can teach people my story, you know, and like help them not go through the the same mistakes I made in life, you know, like, because life is hard, especially like when you don't have, like, you don't have nobody, you know, like, Mm -hmm. you gotta like, you gonna go through losses, you gonna go through tough times, like, you gotta, like, you gotta stay strong, you gotta fight, and like, God, God is real, you know, like God, God can get you through whatever you go through. Like all you got to do is take two minutes or five minutes out of your day and talk to him, you know, like sit down and like just, just vent to him, you know, let him know what's going on. And like, it might not happen when you want it to happen, but like eventually everything you pray for is going to happen. You know, if it's meant to be, it will, you know, like mm-hmm. sometimes we get caught up in praying for things that's just in the moment for us, you know, like. Sometimes we pray things is not good for us, you know, like 
And God, God deep down, if he keep removing those per- person out of your life, they either not good for you or, you know, he's trying to teach you, like, just because you love somebody don't mean you need to keep them around in your life, you know, like, you can love that person from a distance. And, like, I just want to teach people things that I've been through in my life that I didn't have people to talk to about, you know, so mm-hmm. I feel like it's my biggest thing. I'll probably be a motivational speaker one day, I don't know. <laughs> Amen, man. Well, my final thing for you, give Mississippi State fans your three biggest goals you have set for your Mississippi State career. Um, win SEC championship. Um, what else? Make the tournament. Mm-hmm. And obviously win the national, I mean, win the national championship, obviously. So those. Those three would be my goals, you know, just just winning, you know. That mm-hmm. I just want to win and, like, accomplish things that I haven't accomplished in my college career yet. Absolutely, man. Congratulations on the big move, man. I'm excited to see what God's got next for you this upcoming year, man, and appreciate you taking time to come on yeah. today. Yeah, appreciate you, man. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. You're always welcome on, man. God bless. All right, you too, bro.